Hi there, and welcome to the Love or Leave the Law podcast with your hosts, Adam Olette and Casey Berman. This is great. So I want to get into your unique genius, how you just love what you're doing now. Right before we get there, though, take us kind of quickly for the next steps of the path there. Um, what sort of fear, when you realize this isn't for me, what fears and doubts, confusions did you have about, about where you were, excuse me, and possibly leaving? And then how did you take the courage to, to start moving, start moving out? Um, so... <laughs> One thing I did was I had the opportunity opportunity to do a trial externship while I was still at the firm. Right. So I did that for a couple months and I, and I actually hated that even more. I was like, oh. okay, I'm definitely not cut out to be a prosecutor. <laughs> I remember um, that. That's right. And so I came back to the firm. I was like, okay, this is actually not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> I have more confidence now that, um, that I like what I'm doing a little bit more. So um, I think it's great to seek out any opportunities you can find to test out the waters in different right. aspects. So I tested that one out. I was like, okay, that one's not for me. Um, then I found your blog. I can't even remember exactly how I found you, but w we started talking. That's right. Like I'd said, I think this whole time, there was always something in the back of my mind telling me that I don't want to be spend my entire life at a firm and become a partner. So, but how do I figure out what I'm going to do instead? Um, and so we started talking and, you know, that was a very helpful process. But still, and, and maybe my path is a little bit more unique in that I kind of put on pause what I was doing with you because I was going to have the baby. Right. And, um, and it was really kind of having the baby that gave me the confidence to be like, okay, that was like a million times harder than being a lawyer. <laughs> um, if I can do that, I can do anything. <laughs> and it gave, that gave me more of the confidence to be like, okay, really, I should be focused on figuring out what I want to do and not worried about all these. I, mean, I remember after that, you said, okay, Casey, I got your Excel sheet out, the financial projector. I finally tackled this big taboo topic of money. We've worked out my husband, how we're, cause he was in residency. You weren't worried. You're worried about, you know, money situation and where we're going to live in San Francisco. There were all these like factors coming in all over. And I think it's easy just to, to not want to deal with it. And I think you, started dealing with it you started really wrestling these big things which turned out to be not that big um one of them is whispering to you i think right now and um and and all of a sudden you kind of got the the gears in motion yeah it was more just kind of like a bite the bullet type situation where um i was like okay and, and I think to a certain extent it has to be that way because you can never know for sure um, like how things are going to work yeah. out. And uh, so I was like, you know what? I just, I'm ready to do this and I'll figure out the money thing. One of I'm the sure things I could have. Yeah, go ahead. Adam says this all the time, Alex. Adam says this and, and to our listeners, you know, Adam talks a lot about uh, kind of mindfulness and beliefs and so on. It's been just a great, he's really educated me a lot and it's something I practice every day. And I think the one thing he talks about a lot is, you know, it will happen. Uh, sometimes it will force you and hit you over the head or it'll be uncomfortable where you'll have to tell so-and-so you're leaving or they'll tell you, but you can do it more incrementally. But sometimes it gets to that point where you just, you just need to bite the bullet. Yeah. And that's kind of how it worked for me. And like, luckily thus far, everything's generally worked out. <laughs> yeah. So um, I think maybe that's, partially like the power of positive thinking or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I've got a quote from the uh, guest post you wrote with Casey's blog and you call it big law blinders and this will help us segue into how you left and then what you're doing now. Cause I think people really want to hear a lot, but you know, they, they want you to know your path out, but they want to know what other people are doing. They want to know yeah. what is that uh, career change that she's got and, and what is the, the path out? Yes, but what is she doing? So you say, even though I knew I wanted to change careers, it was hard to even imagine what else I might do. So how did you get to from that point to then leaving and, and figuring out or, or kind of getting the pathway lit up for you so that you were doing something else? Yeah, I mean, that's where I think working with Casey and doing the unique genius 
um, exercise was really helpful because, especially because what I ended up discovering that I wanted to do, which is the combining law and design, um, like there's a very few people out there doing that right now and it's still a very nascent topic. So it's not like it was a set alternative career path. Right, yeah. right. So it was, it really took a lot of like self exploration to figure out that that's what I wanted to be doing. Um, and it wasn't like I could just read a list of, oh, I could go in-house or I could. Take a yeah, checklist and pick one off the list exactly. and say, okay, I'm going to go do that. Yeah, I mean, clearly you're doing something that is a new niche, uh, even for lawyers, the stuff you're doing. I, I Tell us more about how you started to take a look at Casey's teachings about unique genius and, and take those lessons and, and start to uh, use your intuition and, and move into that design part. Yeah, so part of it was I picked up this book called Typography for Lawyers. Um, and it was just so eye-opening for me because I, it gave a vocabulary to all these things I'd been thinking and That's doing cool. in practice, but I didn't know why because yeah. I, I had no formal training in design or, um, or, or, or anything like that. Um, so I was like, oh, there's like terminology for this and there's reasons why these things matter that I just kind of intuitively – had there you go. thought about, but I didn't know why. Mm. Um, you found your tribe. You kind of yeah, found exactly. your tribe there. Yeah. And you yeah. created your own job. I love it. It's, it, it's just, you know, so many say, well, Casey, tell me, I'll leave the law when I know what job I'm going to take. And you, you didn't, you created your own, you, you sort of faced the unknown. Yeah. Which, I mean, there's definitely challenges to doing that, but yeah. I think it's, it's great for me because you get to do exactly what you want to do. Yeah. Um, and you, I think that's what I was afraid of. Like there were so many kind of constraints or things imposed on you as yeah. a associate attorney. And I was afraid, like, even if I go in-house, like there's going to be other things I don't like about it. There's going to be politics. Right. Um, I was afraid that if I went into like a predefined job that there would be, there would still be things I didn't like about it. Um, yeah. And I mean, you're just definitely trading those drawbacks for a different set of drawbacks yeah. when you go out on your, your own. But for me, it was just yeah, made sense. So you find the book, you kind of find your tribe, it's aligning with you. Tell us more. Right. So I think the tip would be to just read, like find time to like read or explore these areas of interest and just see what resonates, like right. see what blogs or sources you're being drawn to. Um. And then I think one tip you had given me was to start journaling. And I think that was really crucial for yeah. processing the thoughts and like figuring out, well, why is it that I like this book and kind of grappling with that and, and having to put it into words. Right. Um, so that would be my, my other tip would just be to definitely do something like that. Did you, and I know I'm getting in the weeds here, but did you write by hand somewhere? Did you write in a Word doc? You know, some people go, well, I'd love to journal. I just don't know how, you know, how do you keep it confidential? Like, how did you actually journal? Just so everyone kind of understands. I have it right here. Mm, ah. nice. this is my, this, I mean, it's, this is just like a general purpose notebook now, but it definitely, I have all my leave law behind notes in here. Nice. I'm oh, good. Working together. Um, but oh, they can, people can do it anywhere, right? This is the first entry. Wow, it's been a long time since I kept a journal. What prompted me to start again was a meeting with Casey Berman, a career consultant. I'm going to start working with this one. So. What date is that? Do you have it dated? <laughs> July 21st, 2013. Ah, God. <laughs> Crazy. I love well, it. I, love I have it. a little story about my path out. I, I have a I journal, and, and I started learning more about what's called automatic writing, and all that is is like stream of consciousness writing, where you just take a journal or your computer or whatever, and you just write out whatever's coming through your stream of consciousness. And, and I knew I wanted to teach, and so I have these moleskinas and different types of journals and I, I'm kind of addicted to buying different kinds of journals because I fill them up so fast with ideas. And so I sat down on my patio when I lived in Florida and I said, what do I want to do? And I had this outline of a framework from a couple books I had read about taking a look at what you love to do and what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are. And I just had that journal and I, I have it. 
and I still look at it. And I, when I wrote <laughs> Raising the Bar, I wrote about it in that book because it was such a profound moment for me yeah. that when I wrote that stuff down and I looked at it, I go, holy moly, this is exactly what I want to do. I was on a high. I literally yeah. felt like I was taking drugs, which I never really have done other than a few drinks, alcoholic drinks. But I, I felt like I was on a high for days on end because that journaling helped me to let out yeah. was what was in there that was being kept up, pent up for so long. And it was an amazing process. So I'm glad uh, that that helped you. And I think yeah. people listening to this need to go out and get themselves a journal and, or just take your computer and open a notes program, open word and start to write because it yeah. allows you to like uncork this uh, creativity in you that you had no idea was there and, and ideas come out and I, I can't stop writing ideas now. Once they start to flow, they just don't stop, which yeah. is an amazing thing. So. Yeah. So, yeah. So when I did that, I was doing it by hand, but something I just recently restarted was um, doing this thing called 750words.com. Mm. Have you guys heard of that? Yeah. Uh, no. But because now I'm like trying to blog for my own work and it's really hard to like keep track of all my ideas or even just find time to write. Um, and then I, the other night I was just like up in the middle of the night cause I couldn't sleep. And I stumbled upon this um, blog post talking about morning pages and all these morning different, pages, I, I think yeah. a lot of, um, that's where I learned automatic writing programs. is a lady who's a, I can't remember her name and author. She talks about morning pages and it's just start writing every morning, just start writing yeah. and, and let the creativity flow. Um, yeah. Just make a habit out of it. And so, I found this website called 750words.com where um, I think you, I'm on the free trial right now. I think you end up having to pay for it, but it, it's just like a blank web page, and you just go there every day right. and you start typing and it tracks your word count and it tells you when you've done. Oh, that's so words, good. And it tells you how long, like your average words per minute. And then it gives you like badges. If you do it <laughs> like consecutive days in a row. Fitbit just, for writing. Exactly. I yeah, it. It's just I like, I love it. Just make it a habit. And I, I wrote a blog post. Like, I think the whole point is just to get started. And, you know, these are just first drafts. It's not like you're sitting there wordsmithing. But yeah. it's just a way to get the ideas down. That's so cool. That is so cool. That's great. So thank you for the tactics because I know people say, well, I'd like to write, but, and then they just don't. I mean, I started running when I put my running shoes right by my bed. So when I get up in the morning, like they're there, I can't avoid them. It's all ready for me. Right. Um, and the same thing here, if you just have that medium, whether it's, it's hard copy or something on, on, on your computer, you'll, you, it, it forces you to do it. It's a forcing factor. Um, I, I know the book I wanted to tell everybody about that got me on that path of journaling and automatic writing. It's called The Artist's Way, A Spiritual Path to Higher yeah. Creativity by Julia Cameron. And I wholeheartedly suggest anybody that wants to unleash their cre creativity, check that book out or just get journaling, just get writing. Yeah. I mean, I like, I've heard of that website and I like the idea behind it because most people, especially lawyers, we're left brained. We, we don't think we're creative, but there, it's there, you know, that creativity can be there if you just allow it to be it really expressed. Can. Now, because we got a few, I want to be sensitive to your time, so, um, but a few more questions for you. Talk to us about your unique genius. Talk to us about what you're doing now. You, you touched on it about the alignment and how you just love what you're doing. What's that like? Um, <laughs> it's great. Like, I, I, let's see, where to start? So, yeah. So um, the overarching idea is to draw on design principles to improve the law and legal services. Um, and really that's still fairly broad because d to me, design really just means like thinking intentionally about what it is you're trying to do and mm -hmm. how each step gets you there. Mm -hmm. and, and is that really the best way to be do trying to to, to accomplish your goal, whatever your goal right. is. So right. it, it can be as, you know, detail oriented as the fonts you're using and the page layout of your brief, which was kind of where I started from, because to me that made so much sense that, wow, how you like lawyers write so much and how that writing is visually presented can have an effect on how persuasive it is and how effective it is. It's and huge. Getting your message across. Um, 
so to me, it was just like a no brainer. Like, yes, all lawyers should be caring about this. You know, it's fun. It's so funny to say it because when I write my blog posts, I like to break it out, the text. And I heard from when I was in law school, when you write your blue books, I remember writing just on and on and on, and I got it not a great grade on it. And someone in legal writing and research said, space it out. They don't really like read your exam. read. That's yeah, right. they don't read they it. They just it. go, they oh, they got this issue. They got this issue. They <laughs> got this issue. And really, they know I got the issues because I have a blank space between them. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the same thing goes, I mean, judges are no different. Yeah, they may read a little bit more than an examiner, but it's, it's not just the words and the letters. It's, it's the presentation of it all. Even in something as sort of non-presentable, presentable as, as a brief, yeah? Yeah, so it, and it all goes back to like thinking about what, what it is you're actually trying to say and yeah. then questioning whether what you're saying and writing is actually conveying that so <laughs> idea <cool. laughs> so um that was kind of my starting point and then from there i started learning about visual communication and how lawyers could use more um graphics and illustrations and um and visual elements to that's support right. their work um and the really interesting thing is that there's i mean that's such a fascinating area to me because there's actually a lot of studies that show how using visuals can have a negative impact be, um, yeah. in terms of, you know, jurors can get biased and be more likely to convict just because a photo was shown. Right. Regardless, even if it's a neutral photo. Right. Or even like the, they've shown like the mention of the word neuroscience raises conviction rates. Like even if it's like just said neutrally. Um, so I think it's important to understand like how these visual things have an effect and and make sure we're using them ethically um but i do think that there there is a more of a role for them especially kind of in this day and age it's so much easier with we're processing programs to drop a visual directly yeah. into a brief yeah um that maybe was a lot harder to do back when we were using typewriters so and how are you te- that, like um trial lawyers obviously like higher you know, specialists to help them put together trial presentations. But my point is like this, we can roll this way back and start thinking about these same ideas um, and using these same tools throughout the entire representation. How are you sharing these ideas with lawyers? Tell us more about how you're getting your word out and and what it is you can help them, uh, our profession with. Um, So the first thing I did was start a website and join Twitter um, and just try to start you know, doing content marketing, writing blog posts, getting, just starting conversations with people. Um, it's still a challenge. Uh, I'm, I'm really loving Twitter and I made some great connect. That's actually how I met Gina Cho, by the way. Oh, okay. um, and I think Twitter's great, but it's it tends to be like a lot of like-minded people who already have right. the same set of opinions right. about where the future of the profession needs to go. Yeah. Um, so it's harder to connect, connect with the lawyers who maybe really need my services that way. <laughs> right. So I'm still trying to figure out that educational process because I think, especially when, when I'm offering something kind of new and different, it's... Well, you, you, you give workshops though, don't you? I mean, are they, are you doing live workshops to teach lawyers about this stuff? And I see on your website, you, you give away a free tip sheet about choosing a font for legal briefs and most lawyers have no clue that that same font that we all use times new Roman is probably not the best font to use. And <laughs> so tell us more about that. Yeah. So I have different techniques like a newsletter, um, these lead magnets on my website, like right. the tip sheet, um, webinars. Uh, but really, I don't know, like I'm, I enjoy working with people like one-on-one. So I haven't really productized my services because what everyone needs is different and you have to kind of meet the client where they're at in terms of technology or their own design preferences. So what works for one person is not necessarily going to work for someone else. And um, one of the other things I love about design, they say that, you know, design is all about working within constraints. So, okay, maybe in this particular case, you have court rules or, you know, in a particular jurisdiction, you might have court rules that dictate a font and maybe that's not the best font to use Mm -hmm. but good designers will come in and be like okay well how can i work within that constraint and still 
improve the quality of this document. So you're basically wanting to work one on one with people. You want to get some consultation going and, and just talk with people and, and guide them over the process that you're teaching. Yeah, I mean, that's how I'm approaching it right now. And um, I guess the other kind of stepping back to the kind of more broad discussion for a second, um, I kind of felt when I was starting off and launching my own consulting business, like not knowing whether it was going to be successful or where it was really going to go, that at the very least, it would lead to other opportunities. Sure. Yeah. Um, and I've met so many people and gotten so many diverse opportunities through what I've been doing. Yeah that like maybe that'll change down the road and maybe I won't just be working one-on-one -on -one with individual clients in the future and that's okay. Like that's, that's what I'm doing now, but like it's a constantly evolving process. You know, it's what, what's really inspired me about, about what you've done is this ability to become comfortable with the unknown. You know, we all like to go to movies and see the journey of the hero or the heroine. And, you know, you don't, uh, you think of Lord of the Rings or you think of whatever, like they didn't know what was going to happen. And if we did as movie watchers, we would know the movie, like, why would you buy the ticket? Why would you do it? And, but when it comes to our own lives, we don't want that unknown. We want the stability, security, and that, that makes us uncomfortable. And I think, you know, you really are, not to get too dramatic, but you're kind of the, the real heroine of your own story here. And I think that shift, like you just said, maybe I'll continue consulting. Maybe I won't, but I'm on this path. I'm meeting new people. And just how you're not, you're not that afraid of the unknown, but you're like celebrating what could come down your path. I, I just, I love it. It's inspiring to me. And I think it's something that is a major shift. I know that you've made others who've left the law, they've made it. And it's one of the, the main stumbling blocks to people who are trying to leave law. But once you make that shift, it just, it opens everything up for you. Yeah, I think it's a lot about changing your mindset and to kind of drop back into design for a second. So kind of my path from learning about document design and visual design led me to learn about design thinking as a methodology and how it can be used to kind of rethink how legal services are being distributed systemically and kind of bigger picture questions we can be asking ourselves about the profession. And um the th one of the things I love about design thinking is that it's really as much about cultivating the right mindset to tackle these problems as it yeah. is about following a certain process. And, um, and I think it's especially challenging for lawyers because this particular mindset is very different from, I think, how we're trained, but it's so um, transformative, I think. And one of the key like attitudes to cultivate is curiosity and like mm. developing a mm adopting a beginner's mindset and kind of questioning why things are the way they are. And in, there's actually a book, actually your um, listeners might like this. It's called designing your life. And it's by these two Stanford professors and they're kind of applying this design thinking methodology to not to business problems, but to life design. Yeah. And, um, and one of the things they say about developing this sense of curiosity in yourself is that it, it's what people do to get good at being lucky. Like you, you become a professional person in getting lucky. Like these opportunities just start to come to you because you are asking questions and connecting right. with people. And that's kind of, I feel like what's been happening to me. How, this is good. Alex, how I was speaking to someone last week, he's 43 years old. He wants to start over. There's a path for him and so on. But one of the main obstacles is I'm going to go become a beginner again. I'm going to be at the ground level doing this new type of work. That can be pretty anxious, particularly if you're 35, 40, 45, where now you're sort of on the bottom, not necessarily the bottom rung, but you're not, you're starting over, you're a beginner. How do you celebrate it and not feel anxious about it? Mm -hmm. So another one of the like key keys to design thinking is reframing problems. Um, and so it's, you just kind of like flip that sentence around and like, instead of worried, being worried about being a beginner, you think about how great it's going to be to yeah. be learning something new. And there's actually one of the, huh. in the intro to the book, they go through like four or five case studies of different people. And there was one, one of the women is like an associate attorney and she's miserable and she feels like she's gotten all this outward success, but she's still not happy. So she feels like a failure. And then the next example is like an older man who's kind of in the same boat. He's like been in the same career for decades. Um, 
and it's similar to the, the associate attorney, except that he's been doing it for so much longer that he feels like completely stuck and like he can't. Yeah. Um, change at this point. Yeah. Um, and I forget exactly how they reframe his um, outlook, but that it's, you should give this book to that person because there's yeah. literally, that's literally one of the examples. <laughs> What's the name again? Sorry. Designing Your Life. Designing Your Life, which is written by Stanford professors. So we lawyers who need this empirical background might, maybe we'll gravitate it to more. It's not written just by some 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 guru on a hill somewhere but it's actually it, it's we're starting to realize adam talks a lot about this that it, it this is science this is true a lot of how uh, shifting our beliefs and our mindset can really affect us in the tangible world yeah definitely all right well we're gonna it. let you get back to your little one and yes. your pregnancy we don't want to hold you too long sometimes we run a little over today we don't want to do that because we we know you might have to use the restroom or something i don't know i <laughs> i have to use it and i'm not even pregnant or but feed someone or feed someone this that's is great. right um so you can be found at uh, devendra.design d-e-v-e-n-d-r-a dot design and your twitter handle is at alex a-l I-X-D-E-V-E-N-D-R-A. So we're going to flash it up on the video. If you're listening to this, then slow me down a little bit, rewind me a little bit so you can find her if you're interested in what she's doing. I think what she's doing is profound and it's, it's a total something blowing the doors off anything that we've heard. I've, I've never heard of this and I'm so excited to learn more about legal design because I, I know how uh, video is changing the landscape of marketing and, and there is so many things happening out there that uh, are disrupting everything. And so you're, yeah. you're a disruptor and uh, it's a, in a good way, in a good way, Alex. And so well, uh, any <laughs> parting thoughts, anything else you want to tell us and share with our listeners before we uh, allow you to get back to your life? Um, just that, you know, I, I am very open to making connections with new people. I've, just had such good experiences um, joining this kind of alt legal community since leaving big law and everyone I've met has been so welcoming and will, willing to talk and share their time. And um, I feel the same way. So I would definitely encourage anyone who's interested in just chatting about my path or if they're interested in legal design in particular um, to reach out. I'm happy to, to talk further with anyone. Well, the guest post on Casey's leave law behind.com was April 12th of 2016 and all your info's there. And you wrote that and there's a really, it's a really great post. So if anybody's yeah. interested in learning more about that and uh, having the links and stuff, uh, go to leave law behind and check out the April 12th, 2016 post that Alex did. Well, thank you, everyone. Yes. Alex, thank you. You know, I, I remember you. when you wrote that post, I got emails from people saying, wow, like this is inspiring. You inspired people with the post. And just like I said, listening to you really get a handle on the unknown and celebrate it with that mindset. It, it's a huge shift that we don't see and it's in our heads. We don't see it on our desk. It's not something we can hold, but it really is the informs everything that we do. And so I'm um, you know, we do this podcast because we love doing it. You do the design because you love doing it. And I just, it's, it's so great when we all get together here and, and really do things that, that align with us, that, that come from us naturally. So um, it, it's great to be inspired uh, by, by seeing what you're doing. This is great. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah. And to echo, I think something you said when we were working on the unique genius, you know, it's, can be really hard to see those things that come naturally to you because it's just so effortless and natural that you don't even think about it. Um, but when you figure it out and you figure out how to like spend time professionally doing that, yes. it's amazing. So it's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. All Alex, right. thank you. Definitely. Thank um, you so much. Love having you. Adam, thank you. And everyone yeah, listening thanks, to the podcast, really appreciate you guys being part of the community. Reach out to us. We can put you in touch with Alex. We can answer any questions you have. But again, thank you so much for uh, listening, uh, watching, and being part of the community. Have a yep. great rest of the week.